Okay, if you would all stand, please, for the reading of our scripture. It is not Matthew 11, 7 through 15. It is Romans 13, 1 through 7. Please listen as I read. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from the fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reasons. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrong doer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, God. Amen. Y'all are excited, aren't you? <laughs> so I will say um, I owe thanks to my buddy Kelly McQuaig. Um, he wrote an article a couple of weeks ago for an, an online magazine called Firebrand, and he kind of talked about um, a few of the things I'm going to talk about today, and I was like, man, um, I've been talking around politics, um, which um, y'all just love, right? And so today, I'm going to tell us how to vote, um, according to John Wesley. <laughs> I'm not going to, I want to make sure you hear me say before I start preaching, I'm not telling you who to vote for. I'm giving you some guidelines. You um, yeah. <laughs> and Maddox, just on your side, I've got my clicker with me today, so you don't have to worry about anything. So, and he praised God. <laughs> so let's, um, again, go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Um, Father God, I just thank you so much for who you are, um, just for the joy of being with your people and the joy of being in your place. Um, we know um, that we are living in a contentious time as a nation, but we know that you are the creator of all, that you are the source of all good and the source of all peace. So I pray that you help us to reflect that as your people this morning. Um, I thank you specifically for our sisters and brothers at Gateway. I pray that you be with Pastor John as he is proclaiming your message this morning. Um, just allow him to have a holy boldness that comes from you so he can declare the goodness of your good news of the gospel of the resurrection. And Father, for those of us that are here this morning, I just pray that you soften our hearts, ease our anxieties, and open our ears. And I ask that you allow the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart to be pleasing and acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. What in the world is Paul doing here? Paul is writing in the midst of a Roman government that is vastly different than our government. You need to hear that, right? There is a large difference between the way the government of the Roman Empire operated 2,000 years ago as opposed to how it does of the American government does today. Yet Paul says, um, listen to these words, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which God has established. So who establishes the authority of the governments? What if it's the person that we don't want to win that wins? Who establishes it then? Y'all are a little bit more hesitant on that one. <laughs> 
I don't know. <laughs> we, um, we live in a world, uh, at least, um, maybe this is my opinion, and I'll just say this. I think we live in a world that's very um, American-centric. Yes. And we're very concerned about what happens in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen on social media, I've seen um, from people that I know and love and respect, that if a certain person wins or a certain person loses, all Hades is going to break loose across America. Um, and Jesus is going to come back because apparently Jesus cares more about America than any other nation. <laughs> Like, I'm here to tell you, Jesus loves the Zimbabwe people as much as he loves us. Jesus loves the people in China and the people in Asia more, just as much as he loves us. Um, and when Paul wrote these words, um, be subject to the governing authorities, he wrote to a vastly different culture and climate. Um, where is this book that I'm preaching from? It's not in your bulletin, so you have to remember what, Paul, uh, what Murray said earlier. It's the book of... So Paul was writing a letter to the church in, Rome. yeah, so he's basically writing it to the church in Washington, D.C., right? This is the capital of the empire. This is where the emperors live. This is where they rule. This is where the Senate of the, the Roman Senate gathers together to set the rules and assembly for the people. And their government operated differently than ours does. Our government gives us the freedom and the ability to be here with no fear of arrest, with no fear of persecution, with no fear of death, because we have the freedom to worship in the manner that we choose. In Paul's day, the Roman Empire had a slightly different mandate. Um, or Paul probably wrote this. Y'all heard me probably talk about um, one of my least favorite slash favorite Roman Empire um, emperors before. During the days of Nero. Um, if you don't know much about Nero, I don't think I've told y'all this story from the pulpit before, at least recently. One of Nero's favorite pastimes was he would take Christians, he would tie them up to the stake, he would put them in his gardens, and he would light them on fire so people could see the gorgeousness of his, his gardens at night. So Paul is writing to the people that could be facing that sort of severe persecution and what is he saying? You need to be subject to your governing authorities because God has established them. If God established the authority and might of Nero and Domitian to persecute Christians, I wholeheartedly believe whatever the will of the people is in a couple of weeks that God will establish Trump or Harris or who knows, maybe some crazy third party person will win this time, right? Okay, probably not. And listen to how Paul continues. Whoever rebels against the authority of the government is rebel rebelling what God has instituted against. This isn't a letter to the Americans. This is to people that are facing persecution. Do you want to be free of fear of authority? Then do what is right that will be commended. For the one authority comes from God. And God's servant is called to do good. If you do wrong, be afraid, because then your rulers will have a reason to come after you. And this is a sermon for April, the latter part of this. This is also why you pay your taxes. Because God's authorities and God's servants give their full time to governing. And I don't know how many of y'all know, um, I've gotten to know in my six and a half years here, um, our mayor and many of our village council officers, and even though sometimes um, I say some not nice things when I run over some potholes that are still in the road, um, it only took them a year and a half to fix the pothole in front of the church. But praise God, it's mostly fixed now, right? Um, I still pay my taxes. Now, don't get me wrong, I, try, I pay a person to help me find as many loopholes to get out of paying as many taxes as I can. Um, but God calls us to be faithful citizens. And being a faithful citizen, specifically here in America, means that I wholeheartedly believe that each and every one of us that have the ability to vote need to use that ability. Whether you agree with um, where I'm at politically and, um, or where our neighbors are at or where our country's at, God gives us the ability to vote and we need to do that. Um, and so this morning, um, in addition to looking at this text from Romans, I want to go over John Wesley's three practical rules for people who could vote. And John Wesley wrote these on October the 6th, 1774. So for those of you that are um, history buffs, 
What was going on in England in 1774? Do y'all remember there was this little country that over here that was starting to get a little anxious about no taxation without representation? This was all going on at this time. You think we live in a politically stressful day. Could you imagine having a country across the world that we are in charge of starting to rebel against our powers and might and authority? Who was going to be in control? Were they going to make sure the colonies were suppressed and submit to them? Were they going to give the colonies more freedom? It was a very anxious tax year in 1774 when Wesley wrote these three rules. And here they are. Maybe. <laughs> to vote without fee or reward for the person they judged most worthy. To speak no fear or no evil of the person that they voted against. And to take care that their spirits were not sharpened against those who voted on the other side. I'm going to break these down for a little bit. This first one, um, to vote without fee or reward for the post person that you judge most worthy. I don't know about y'all, I've never been walking into a bowling booth and somebody's handed me a 20 and said, vote for me. If they did, it might sway my vote a little bit. <laughs> but what Wesley is saying is without fee or reward, you have to discern who you believe is the candidate that is most worth. The issue um, with me and my discernment, um, and I like to think of myself as a relatively educated guy. Proverbs reminds us. In Proverbs, oh, I went to the wrong book, I went to Psalms. In Proverbs 28, 26, those who trust in themselves are fools, but those who walk in wisdom are kept safe. The reality is um, sometimes I think we walk into the voting booth a little bit foolish. Um, and I'll confess, sometimes I voted for a person because their name sounded better than the person of the person they were running against. <laughs> It's like a local election, and it doesn't really matter, right? That's probably actually the place that it matters the most. And the problem with the wisdom of the world um, is if you want to hear a certain story about a candidate, turn up to a certain station, and they will tell you the story you want to hear. Right? One news station wants to sell one story about a candidate, and the exact opposite news station will sell you the exact opposite story. They'll take the same words out of the same person's mouth and they'll twist them to make them say what they want them to say so that we can be like, that's right, I agree with you. Um, I'm here to tell you, um, we, Ashley and I, have done this quite a bit during our lives is we find nonpartisan voting guides that have quotes and stances from the candidates on the various issues and we read through those before we walk into the voting booth so that I can know this is where this person stands on this issue. Um, God has given us the ability to live in a day and a time where we have access to all the information in the world. Why would we not just spend a little bit more time researching the candidates to make sure they believe with what you think you should be voting on? And I'm not here to tell you what the most important issue in your life is. That's your discernment. That's your call. That's your relationship with Jesus Christ. But I'm calling and telling you that we have to have wisdom when we walk into that voting booth. Because it makes a difference who serves our community, who serves our state, and who serves in the Oval Office. And we, unlike the Christians in Paul's day, have the ability to say something about it. So use that ability. Vote without fee or reward for the person you judge most worthily. That's pretty easy, right? Y'all can do that? No. That wasn't rhetorical. <laughs> You can vote. You can do a little bit of research. Okay, we're with me. It gets a little bit harder as Wesley goes on. Speak no evil of the person they vote against. This is very contrary to our society. We have the right people and the wrong people. I can't even say right and left because then that has political implications, right? I mean, that's why our country's so divided. It can't decide if it wants to go right or left, so it's split down the middle. 
speak no evil of the person they vote against. The very first verse that I memorized as a Christian in high school was Ephesians 4.29. Don't let any wholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs so that it may benefit those who listen. So let's just break this down a second. Don't let any what? What's unwholesome? Something that breaks. Something that tears down. Something that divides. Something that curses. Something that speaks evil of. Don't let that come out of your mind. And this isn't just a political statement. Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus in a completely different context here. He's saying this about one another. Is this is who we should be. Is We shouldn't let anything bad come out of our mouths, but only what is helpful. What's helpful? Is me telling you how much better my candidate is beneficial for you? Is me telling you how much better my football team is better? Oh, wait. <laughs> but he's got his TCU shirt on today, so. <laughs> helpful. Why? To build others up. Our words have might and power. <clears throat> We can use them to tear down, to kill, steal, and destroy, or we can use them to build up. And this isn't just on the election, but this is in general. And it's according to whose needs to their needs so that it may benefit them. And this is difficult for me. I think this is difficult for us is because a lot of the times when I'm thinking about the words that are going to come out of my mouth, I'm thinking about how they're affecting me. Right? I'm not worried about how they're going to affect you because that's your problem and how you receive with them. But what Paul says is that we speak so that others can listen, so we can build them up. It's about them. It's about the people that we're speaking to, the people that are listening to us, so that they can be benefited from it. And man, in this role, speaking no evil of the person they vote against. I think in our society, it's not just speaking, but it's writing posting on social media it's pissing around friends because let me tell you I have lost so much respect for multiple Christians and Christian leaders because of what they post on social media about how right they are I mean I think anything I hope my Sunday school class can teach you we've been slowly going through the book of Revelation this year is um, even though I am educated man a lot of times I don't know much but what I do know is the words of my mouth have an impact on the people that listen to them. And if we're supposed to be the light upon the hill, the glory of God into the world, and we're using our mouths and our actions and our social media posts to destroy and defame other people, we are not doing what God is calling us to do. We, as followers of Jesus Christ, are called to be set apart, not just by our political choices, but by how we treat one another. Speaking no evil means not just words, but actions. And we have to stop resisting the temptation to spread half-truths, insults, and divisive rhetoric, and instead be the people that Christ has called us to be. If you remember... In the Beatitudes, Jesus says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. God calls us to be a people who sow peace, not division, that sow love and not hate, that show joy and not discord. Speak no evil of the person you vote against. So we get from how to vote to how to speak about other people to this last rule goes internally. Take care that their spirits were not sharpened against those who voted on the other side. I think what Wesley is doing here is Wesley is moving us from external things to internal things. Um, it's, James says that it's wise if a person has control of their mouth. But Jesus says, I would rather you have control of your heart. 
I would rather know what's going on internally. Um, out of the overflow of the mouth, the heart speaks. And I think where Wesley's getting us here is that um, not only are we not supposed to speak poorly about people, but we're supposed to have such a spiritual discipline and be so formed into the image of Christ that our spirits are wholly related to God during this whole process. That their spirits are not sharpened against those that are on the other side. We live in a world that is vastly divided politically. And it's my way or the highway. It's my candidate or to hell. Uh, and if my person doesn't win, we're going to all be damned. Can I say that? Yeah, I can say that. We're in church. We're all going to be damned. Like, that's not a cuss word. That's a state of reality that people live in. God's got it. God's got it no matter who wins. And we should show our, submit, our submission and our respect to them. And I'm tired of living in a society where the church people in the church say, well, that's not my president. I didn't vote for them. You may have not voted for them, but they're still your leader. God still placed them in that position. Whether you like them or not, whether you agree with their policies or not, it is our attitude to be that of humble and love and respect and grace-filled so that people will know that we are Christians. In fact, Paul talk, um, Jesus talks about this. Um, one of my a great verse for us to remember, and I left it blank because I want to see if you can guess it. In John 3, 13, 35, it says, Everyone will know that you are disciples if you... Root for Texas Tech, right? Like, sorry, buddy. No, and like, really, the Christians beat us yesterday, right? Like, we should be rejoicing that Christians can beat the heathens of Texas Tech. I didn't say that. I did. I know my people. Everyone will know my disciples if you are over six foot tall. That's not what Jesus says, right? It's not a matter of height. Or if you are a certain skin color. No, Jesus loves people. Um, one of my favorite things about being in the Middle East the last time we were there was when we were in Jordan. They had a church um, that was built in the second, third century. And they had a mosaic floor that was larger than our whole sanctuary. And on this mosaic floor, um, there was an African person standing over here with dark skin. And there was a Middle Eastern person over here um, with some olive skin. And then there was um, a Roman person standing over here with light skin. And they were all gathered together worshiping God. If they could get that 150 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I think we need to get that today as well, right? It doesn't matter what we look like. He doesn't say, you can only worship me if you're a certain type of person. He says, you can be my disciples if you vote a certain way. I mean, I will tell you, this is a fallacy in the modern North American church on both sides. It's we have pastors that are saying, if you don't vote as a Republican, then you're not truly following Jesus. Or you have pastors that say, if you're not truly a dis um, Democrat, you're not following Jesus. Jesus does care how you vote. But he cares more about the attitude of your heart when you do so. What does he actually say? By this, everyone will know my disciples if you love one another. This means that we love people irregardless of those things. Irregardless of if they are on the donkey side or elephant side irregardless of if they vote for or root for Texas Tech or TCU or Oklahoma State or any New Mexico State, right? I can't forget our New Mexico schools here. Um, irregardless of how tall or short you are, irregardless of what your skin color is, irregardless of what your economic status is, irregardless of what your orientation is, he says you will love one another. And that is how you will know that you are my disciple. Instead of allowing our hearts to harden against people that disagree with us, which is often the case in the American political system, Christ is calling us to have softened hearts and that even in our disagreements, our identity as Jesus Christ unites us more deeply than any other issue. Our identity as followers of Jesus Christ is our primary identity. 
And if it's something other than that, church, we need to repent and get that off the throne of our lives and put Christ back on it. And if you're offended, I pray that maybe some of you are, that we need to remember that Jesus is the Lord of our lives. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. These authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling what God has instituted, and that will bring judgment on themselves. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but simply as a matter of conscience. We live in a world that loves to divide us so they can sell their stories. But we, as people of the gospel and the good news of Jesus' kingdom, must live lives that are contrary to that shows that we love one another and we love this world regardless of where they're at. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Wesley reminds us to vote without fee or reward, so go do your homework. Don't let it affect your speech. But most importantly, sisters and brothers, don't let us affect our hearts. Let Christ continually rule. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, I pray that as we get closer and closer to the election, that we would trust you more than we trust the political parties and news outlets of the day. Um, for those of us that have voted, I thank you um, that they have expressed their civil right. And for those of us that have yet to do so, I pray that you help get us to the polls um, in your timing. I pray um, not only that we would not only not speak evil against those that we vote against, but that you would continually transform the attitude of our lives and our hearts. Allow our spirits to be melded to you. Allow your glory to become our glory so that we can love the world the way that you did with the love of Christ on the cross. And Father, for those of us that may have anything else at the center of our lives, um, whether it's politics or sports or money um, or religion or family, that you would allow us to take them off so that you can continue to be the Lord of our lives day after day after day. We ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Know if you'd like to know more about what it means to live in this relationship with Jesus. The authors are always open. Um, if you want to know more about what it means to be a member of the church, come and find me.